Hello. You may remember that back on America's Independence Day, my home country of the United Kingdom went to the polls in the country's most recent general election. And later this year, on the UK's Guy Fawkes Night, Americans, including yours truly, are set to do the same. And so, because this year's presidential election marks my first since becoming a US citizen, I thought now would be the perfect time to discuss all the ways British and American general elections are very different. Throughout, I'll be using words like Democrat, Republican, Labour, Conservative. Names that should bring about unbridled harmony in the comments section. And I should hope so too, because later on there's going to be a very silly end to this video that should unify all of us from now until the end of time. And so, just as millions are set to cast their vote in November, why not help me reach 1 million subscribers? If you've not yet become one yourself, do that now! In the meantime, here's how UK and US elections are completely and utterly a little bit different. In order that the messaging of this video not get lost in the pond, it's absolutely crucial that we start with a vocab lesson. Because just like all other facets of life, Britain and America do differ on their election terminology. For instance, if you've ever seen BBC election coverage, you might have heard the term swingometer. A swingometer is a news graphic highlighting the impact of swing voters, that is, voters who have switched allegiance to another party. Given America's love of election graphics, you could quite see the swingometer taking off here, especially in light of the American concept of swing states. These are states that are so tightly contested they could conceivably flip in favour of the other party. The nearest equivalent in parliamentary UK politics are swing seats, which are seats that swing, but more on seats in a minute. Meanwhile, with both countries so polarised, it can be quite difficult to cut through political bias in the news. However, thankfully for me, no such memo is lost in the pond thanks to today's sponsor, Ground News. They are an app and website that gathers related news from across the political spectrum, so readers can easily compare coverage and spot the spin. So when, say, a candidate picks a running mate, you've got access to all of the Ground News articles found reporting on it to easily see how outlets on the left, right and in the centre are framing the story. For example, liberal sources seem to believe that Tim Walls can bring the Democratic ticket back to the party's roots, while Conservative publications appear to fear just how far left he leans. While I do have my political stances, I don't think the news should be in the business of influencing them. To facilitate this, Ground News also has a lovely feature called the Blind Spot Feed, highlighting news stories that receive disproportionate coverage on one side of the spectrum. This feed allows readers to step outside of their echo chamber and into the other side's news reality for a better understanding of the narratives that can shape the way a person thinks and votes. Better yet, Ground News lets me alternate seamlessly between American and British news, making it easier to divorce myself from the agendas of UK tabloids. And so, as we approach the US presidential election, I highly recommend using Ground News' election page to cut through political bias and arrive at your own conclusions. Head to ground.news slash lost, or scan my QR code to save 40% on the same unlimited access vantage plan that I use. The link is in my description below. To extraterrestrials only half listening to Earth radio waves, it might sound like the sole purpose of general elections is to elect a president or prime minister. After all, the overwhelming emphasis is on our national candidates. But this doesn't tell the whole story. One often overlooked difference between UK and US elections is that US voters get to select their presidential candidate at the ballot box. Back in the UK, we don't actually vote for prime minister. Instead, we vote for our local member of parliament, more commonly known as an MP. He or she is elected to lead a parliamentary constituency of which 650 make up the UK. That means there are 650 MPs. On July 4th, the Labour Party secured a majority of them and thus formed a government. And since Keir Starmer was party leader, he got to be Prime Minister and live in this modest flat in London. But it gets confusing because the PM is also an MP. You see, while most of the country technically didn't vote for or against Sunak or Starmer, voters in their local constituencies did. Of course, many will vote for the party of their preferred Prime Minister in an effort to elect them into office. This November, I get to vote for arguably America's nearest MP equivalent, members of Congress. But Congress is a different branch of government to the one inhabited by El Presidente, so the party that forms a House majority does not by default enter the White House. This is why Americans also 
vote for president on the same day. For newbies, this is where it gets confusing. You see, at first, I couldn't wrap my head around the Electoral College, partly because I spent four years thinking it was an Ivy League school. But it turns out that the Electoral College is how the president gets elected. Each state gets a certain number of electoral votes. How are these determined, Lawrence? I was just getting to that. The number of electoral votes is equal to the number of senators and Congress people, persons within that state. So, my home state of Illinois has two senators and 17 members of Congress. Therefore, in Illinois, 19 electoral votes are up for grabs. Although Illinois, unlike Wisconsin and Michigan to the north, is not a swing state. That said, whoever gets the most votes within a particular state takes all of that state's electoral votes. Whichever presidential candidate carries the most of these across all states gets to be president. The United States remains the only country on Earth to elect an executive president in this way, with other countries having long since done away with the idea. <laughs> In many ways, US presidential elections are a lot like the Olympics. Millions tune in from around the world, flags are waved in abundance, and each one is four years in the making. Easy. In the UK, the routine isn't quite so steady and predictable. Or routine. I mean, sure, by law, general elections must take place no more than five years after the previous one. But despite that, the UK has actually had more general elections since the year 2000 than the United States. In fact, we've had three in the last seven years alone. So why is that? Simple. Snap elections. Snap elections are elections that are called by the sitting Prime Minister earlier than the scheduled five-year date. These are typically done in situations where the Prime Minister wants to bolster his or her party's majority, or seek a mandate from the UK voters to pursue a particular issue. In the US, where the four-year timeline is set in the Constitution, snap elections don't exist at the presidential level. Even when a president resigns or dies in office, there's no special election to replace him because the vice president immediately ascends to the over office. By law, presidential elections are also held on the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So, barring a radical overhaul of the US Constitution, we can comfortably predict the precise date of all future presidential elections from now until the end of time. Oh, and speaking of time... One of the most notable differences between UK and US elections is how long they last. In the UK, this year's election season was over in just 43 days, but it might come as a surprise to some that this was considered by several British news outlets to be, quote, long. And by some, I chiefly mean Americans, because the 2024 presidential election has been going on since about 1788. And while that might sound like British sarcasm, election season on this side of the pond does feel like it starts when the previous one ends. In reality, the first candidates start to emerge about two years before election day, which is still a long time. In that time, you could have had two kids, or got an associate's degree, or lived under four UK prime ministers. Partly, the extreme length of US elections is due to the existence of primaries and caucuses, in which states vote to nominate a presidential candidate for both of the major parties. In Britain, those candidates, otherwise known as party leaders, are elected by party members months, often years, before a general election is even called. Therefore, the concept of primaries doesn't exist in the UK, unless we're talking about what Americans call elementary schools. As we've seen, the campaign trail in America is long in terms of time, but also in terms of distance. Leading candidates have to win over significantly more people across a much larger landmass than their equivalents in the UK. This partly is why campaign spending is so high in the United States, but it's by no means the only reason. Two terms that I hear a lot during US election cycles are PACs and Super PACs. And while those might sound like computer game characters from the 80s, a PAC is a political action committee. The major parties pulling in millions of dollars from PACs and super PACs, with much of it going to advertising campaigns in the aforementioned swing states. In the UK, such vast expenditure would not only be unnecessary, it would actually be illegal. And that's because the UK's Electoral Commission imposes stricter rules over campaign spending than the US. Individual candidates can spend a fixed amount of £11,390, plus either 8 pence or 12 pence per voter, depending on the constituency. The UK also has stricter rules around television advertising. In that, it doesn't actually allow it. Following the passage of the 2003 Communications Act, political advertising on TV and radio is prohibited. Not so in the US, where election season brings out a litany of ads, often with menacing narration and soundtrack attacking the other candidate. That said, there is one televisual event that the UK borrowed from the US, debates. Fifty years after America's first televised oratory showdown between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, the UK had its first in 2010, airing one at every election since. 
Meanwhile, during my 16 years in the US, I've often had late-night chats with disillusioned voters frustrated at the country's two-party system. After all, in a country that boasts more than 40 flavours of Coca-Cola, you'd think the US would offer more electoral options than most. And actually, one look at the election results of 2020 offers a reminder that other parties do exist. Most prominently, these include the Libertarian and Green parties. However, between them, the two carried less than 1.5% of the popular vote. In the UK, where those same gripes about two-party politics often arise, other parties do nonetheless fare relatively well. For example, in July's election, several seats were picked up by the Liberal Democrats and, what do you know, the Green Party. In fact, as of that election, 13 different parties are represented in the House of Commons. Compare this to the US House of Representatives, in which the duopoly of Democrats and Republicans is only rarely supplemented by an independent or two. And for me, the most unfortunate part is that Americans don't routinely get to see their elected officials, forced into photo ops with wacky novelty candidates like former Prime Minister Theresa May was. It would immeasurably improve US politics. I mean, imagine your favourite candidate learning of his or her fate standing next to Elmo. Because that also happened to Theresa May and Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer. I swear, this is not what British people mean when they talk about the Muppets in Parliament. But, speaking of people, that brings us on to this. Back in the late 90s, when I first became politically aware, I distinctly remember a question coming up in a UK chat room, and it was this. Why do so few Americans vote? At the time, this question was not without merit. Back then, the UK was going through this weird phase in which 75% of its people actually turned up to the ballot box. And it was through that lens that we asked the question, because we'd heard that US voter turnout was in the low 50s. And so we got all British about it and just chalked it up to American apathy. Well, the 90s came to an end, and for reasons that I won't get into, here, turnout at UK general elections fell dramatically. Despite somewhat recovering in the 2010s, the last three elections have all provided diminishing returns. Meanwhile, since those chat room observations of the past, US turnout has generally been on the up, to the extent that 2020s was the highest since 1900. Moreover, it was 7% higher than turnout for this year's election in the UK. How times have changed, though not quite as much as me, apparently. Anyway, as promised, here it is. A silly end to this video. Anybody who's watched this channel on a regular basis will know that I have a particular interest in the English language. And this got my producers, which is my wife, asking me, what is your favourite linguistic fact about presidential elections, Lawrence? And after thinking long and hard about it, I arrived at this. The US has never elected a president whose first or last names start with an S. And that's amazing, especially since S is one of the most common letters used at the start of last names in the country. It's also highly common among first names. This is reflected in the fact that five major presidential nominees had last names beginning with S. Winfield Scott, Horatio Seymour, Al Smith, Adlai Stevenson II, and Adlai Stevenson II again. And two whose first names did the same, Strom Thurmond and Samuel J. Tilden. And there's a reason most of us don't remember their names, because history tends to forget the losers. And sure, the experts will point out that Grover Cleveland, who was president twice, was actually born Stephen Cleveland, so your observations are a rubbish mate. Well, firstly, Stephen Cleveland sounds more like a comedy detective than a president. And secondly, there's a reason that he changed it. He presumably looked at the same list that I did. I mean, in the UK, not only have our two most recent prime ministers had S names, but also nine of their predecessors. So that just leaves me with one question. Are Americans just more suspicious of the letter S? And if so, is that because they're more likely to see an actual snake in real life? That, that is, that's two questions. Anyway, thanks for watching. Keep it civil in the comments. And since elections are all about numbers, I did a video looking at the ways in which Britain and America use numbers very differently. You'll watch that next. Until the next video, goodbye.